Hello and welcome to Glimmer of Genius, episode 18. This is a podcast all about Magic the Gathering, bringing you the latest happenings in the MTG community, from news to tournament reports, deck ideas to MTG finance. We are Glimmer of Genius. If you want to learn more about the show, then check us out on Facebook at Glimmer of Genius with capital G's. Leave a comment or a question for the show and become part of the conversation. It lets us know you like what you hear and is a great way for you to support the show. My name's Luke Vincent and I make YouTube videos. On the line with me is Simon Wright, MTG Trader. We are missing a co-host though. Grant is otherwise engaged. Uh, maybe he will join us a bit later on, but it's just Simon and me today. How are you this evening, Simon? Where's Grant? I actually don't know where Grant is. Um, He's got a social life now. It's not on. Oh, I know. Unacceptable. We can say what we like. He won't listen back to the show. I don't think he ever listens. No, so. he doesn't. No. <laughs> but um, We did say we'd slag him off as well. We'll definitely do that. I'll think of all sorts of horrible things to say. I mean, he likes he likes unstable. So, I mean, I've, I've lost all respect for him. You know, I like unstable. Actually, to be fair, I haven't seen any spoilers for unstable yet, apart from the Squirrel Link and Crow Storm. I don't know what to tell you. It's you're too spiky. You need to enjoy <laughs> magic more. I enjoy embrace the fun. I enjoy fun in a safe, controlled environment. environment. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Okay, so on this episode today, we're going to talk about the triple header of GPs that has been this last weekend. We have Warsaw, Shanghai and Atlanta. But before we do that, Simon, what have you been up to this week in Magic? This week in Magic, I have been drafting Ixalong. Ooh, successfully? Successfully. Actually, not that successfully. I went to one. That's fine. I don't get to draft as much as I, I used to. So I'm a bit out of practice, but I was in a pod of six, mm -hmm. and nothing to my other poddies, but they there were a lot more. There was a lot more newer players there, and I seemed to be in the the pod with the with, with the newer players. And so I thought, oh, I can free out this one. I've got it in the bag. Mm -hmm. Not remembering that the guy directly opposite me in the pod, so free away from me, was also quite experienced drafter. Ah. He was in like the optimal position away from me. To make sure he picked up all the good cards as well, and um, I met him in the finals and and lost to his red black aggro pirates. Mm. Yeah, it was a very weird game. Though. A good game one, I thought. Yes, got it, got it in the bag. And um, game two, I think we both might have gone to five. Ugh. And it was a horrible. But he kept a two land hand, and I kept like a four land hand, and it went. Yeah, so he was just mana screwing, and I was just mana flooded the whole game. And it's very weird matchup. That's strange. What were you playing? Uh, I was playing. Green, blue, merfolk. I'd say it's merfolk, but I had no... Um... Merfolk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I had good merfolk, but I had no... What's the incident called? River Herald's Boon. Herald's Boon. Yeah. No Herald's Boon. There's only six player draft, I didn't see a single one. Wow. But I'll tell you what I did have. I had a river sneak. What's the enchantment called? One with the wind? No. Oh, what then? Like, oh, uh, Mark of the Vampire? Uh, water, water... Oh, oh water, deep, deep root waters. Deep root waters. Yeah. And a storm sculptor. Bouncy fun goodness. So, <laughs> I was my first round opponent. Phoenix, I think she's been playing for around three or four months. And um, <laughs> I had River Sneak in, on board. Yeah. Deep root waters after that. Yeah. So, turn two, turn three, and turn four played storm sculptor. The way it went was, of course, I cast his storm sculptor. So, I triggered deep root, roll, deep root waters. Yeah. So, uh, put that on the stack first. So I've got the token into play, triggering River Sneak. Yeah. Plus one, plus one. Storm Sculptor then entered the battlefield, giving River Sneak again, and I returned the token to my hand. Obviously, killing it. And of course, she's got any cards. I was trying to explain this while I was on the stack, you just looked at me, like, yeah. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was great. Well, um, why didn't you do the other thing? If you. What's the other thing? You you had you had everything there set up for you. If mm. you cast you got that board state and you cast the, the, the unblockable guy which bounces something, target yeah. himself. Nah. And then you can return it, and then you cast him again, you get another Merfolk, so you get another two triggers on your uh thingy sneak, making all these you, you have a, a Merfolk every turn. Yeah, but 
my deck was mainly Murphy. I mean, I'd rather not have to spend the, the, the. I'd rather have a three. She was quite low to the ground and aggressive, and I, I was just playing. Was she white red dinosaurs? I believe. Yeah. Uh, so she had some big blockers as well. I'd rather have the unblockable guy on the board. Fair enough. Than having to play four mana each time just to get an extra one one. But yeah, no, I see your point. Yeah. But it also had a a rip jaw raptor. Ooh. And a couple of pounces. No. Nice. <laughs> and a savage stomp. Oh. Uh, so I'll just flick the deck now because oh yeah, and a foiling snapping oh two snapping snail back. So it was mainly Murphy. Loco was Murphy with a dinosaur top end curve to uh, mm. finish it off. Bringing the beats. It was beautiful. <laughs> I, I really like it. It's my one of my favourite decks I've drafted so far. I'll tell you what I have been playing. Yep. Elder Scrolls Legends. What even is that, Simon? Sounds like it's not magic related. I'd say it's not, but um, <laughs> it's free to play on Steam, uh-huh. and it's it's pretty great. I've got to make sure the wife's not around listening. Basically, I've sunk in around 10 hours in a week, okay. which is quite a lot for me for an online game. A lot any game, actually, that I need to, to, to sneak in to manage to play that. Mm. Um, the gameplay is not... It's not magic. It is good, but it's not magic. But what I'm hoping for is the extra bits that come online. You, you've got a story mode... In complete levels, you get like uh, gold and new cards. When you level up, you can evolve cards. And I was, I'm playing it thinking, yeah, this is okay, this is fun. But I'm thinking, if Magic Arena is actually wanting to compete in this sort of well, this sort of Elder Scrolls Legends, um, Hearthstone, that sort of realm now, what they might do when, when it comes in, comes to play. But yeah. with Magic as the game instead of some knockoff. So it's got me quite excited thinking about that, actually. So it's just making you more hungry for Magic Arena? Yes, yeah. very much so. The game's quite fun, um, but this, the biggest thing is you can't... Your creatures can't block. Okay. I mean, so some ways it's a bit once limited interaction sometimes, but there, there, there's other stuff that's going on. I won't go into it. I was hoping Grant would be on the line and he might have played it and gone, yes, I know what this is. <laughs> um, but the, just the stuff that goes around it, like... Just, how the more you put, like, you get a login bonus. You log in, you get gold, you get crystals, blah, blah, blah. You use them to buy extra cards or morph cards. And if that can be fitted to a magic theme... I'm sure I'll... they'll have some sort of in-game currency of some kind. Hopefully it's not just actual currency. <laughs> I, I live in hope. I really do. I'd like to think that they would have learnt from the complete train wreck that is magic online, and it will be something much more positive. It um, won't be magic online. It won't be a contest. It won't be what some of us are hoping for. It's going to be a cantrip. And maybe, maybe. I, in... I, I think I like the cantrip thing. If, if they can do what Elder Scrolls Legends did and what I heard Hearthstone's doing as well, and like you win tickets to play online drafts for free and stuff like that. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. That's, that's what I want for magic. Yeah, 100%. For my online magic, not my competitive face to face spitting your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's I think that's what everyone wants, really. Because, I mean, you know, sometimes when you, you just want to play for fun, even if you are a tournament grinder or whatever, you do just want to play Magic because you enjoy it. And Magic Online is not is, is really not built for that. No, so, no, that's the thing. I found myself with three Eves and I was like, I could sit down, do a draft or, or a sealed event, and it could be a league, so I don't have to commit the whole time to it. I could just play a little bit. I was like... I just find Elder, Elder Scrolls and play for like half an hour or an hour and, and yeah. call it quits whenever I want. So I was playing against the AI, but I was having a whirl all the time. Yeah. But, uh, but because it's, it's a game I'm not familiar with, I mean, there's a, the whole deck building behind it as well, but I'm just like, I don't have time to learn all the cards, all all the meta decks, whatever. I'm just I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to play the story along with the decks that are pre-built and the cards are unlocked with the pre-built deck at the moment. Um, but if it's magic, I'll be like, I know these cards, I know the game, I know what I'm doing. I've got the time, so I'm whispering a little bit in case the wife ends up going, you've been doing what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure they are learning from these other things that exist. You know, Magic Online is symptomatic of, of its time when it was first out. The way people play games online has vastly changed to when Magic Online first existed. Yeah, they need. They just. They simply need to compete. Otherwise, it's just it's going to fall apart and to be nothing. Uh, yeah, definitely. But what I've seen of it is really positive. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. So, so what have you been doing in Magic? I I was helping uh, my one of my teammates prepare for an RPCQ. Uh, so I did some modern testing this this last week. So I proxied up Counters Company in Modern, which is the deck that basically plays Mana Dorks and the Vizier of Remedies. 
and yeah. walking ballista combo to and devoted druid so basically devoted druid lets you make mana and then you can untap it and put a minus on minus on counter on it and it will let you then make another mana and vizier of remedies means you when it's in play you put one less minus one minus one counter on something if it wouldn't take a minus one minus one counter on it so effectively you can tap and untap devoted druid for as much mana as you see fit and that then goes hand in hand with walking ballista to put unlimited counters on it and then you shoot your opponent so you just win on the spot so that's the deck and it's really cool actually playing that in modern it wasn't like it took it to an fnm and you know we're had a, a match loss record but actually we you know played against Eldrazi Tron with it and one of the things we sort of learned from that matchup uh, is game one felt really favoured in Collected Company because there wasn't that many ways Eldrazi Tron had to interact with the combo. I beat Philippe one game through a dismember and a turn three Thought Not Seer. I still just won uh, because it just you know I had I just drew another creature another combo piece that he killed and then by the time he cast Thornton Seer it didn't matter. I just had enough redundancy in my hand from between Collected Company and uh, Call of Calling. Nice. It was just like so it's pretty horrible. But then after game two he boards in a lot more removal. Uh, things like Graft Digger's Cage which shuts down Coco and Call of Calling. So it felt a lot more favoured. So you need things like Reclamation Sage or Quasali Pride Mage out of the sideboard. So that was interesting to play that match up. So how the, I, th- I think we had three local players attend the that RPTQ engine brew in the end, didn't we? We did. How did they get on? I think they all bombed out. I think it was really, oh, really yeah. tragic. I know um, I could be doing them a disservice, but for, uh, from what little I heard, chatter. I it's a, it's a long Edinburgh is a long way to travel for us. Yeah. Um, like the fir- probably the furthest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we couldn't be further away, really. No, I did it'd feel be, for it'd them. Still be in the UK anyway. Yeah. Mm. So no, yeah, a bit, a bit of a shame. But there we go. And then outside of that, just been testing for standards for the PPTQ this weekend. So that's that's fine. Not sure what I'm going to play yet. Probably will just be Teamer if I can't get this other deck that I'm working on to to be that's, what I'm uh, going to be. That's this Sunday at Dice Beam, listeners. In yeah. case <laughs> we get it out before Sunday, I doubt yeah. we will. But I'm going to try. Just just in case. I will try yes. my darndest. Okay, so that was me. So what we're going to move on to next is some GP info now there was three grand prix this this last weekend gone there was warsaw atlanta and shanghai so we have three lots of deck lists three lots of top eights to kind of go over so with that in mind we're not going to probably go over them in as much depth as we might normally like to especially as no. a lot of the decks will be teamer and like energy based decks which are nothing really new so and especially since you said me Five minutes before we started. Um, yep. Well, <laughs> as always. Here's some lists. What's going on? Yeah. So let's start with Warsaw. Warsaw. Okay. So in Warsaw, there were five energy decks in the top eight. One of them Ooh. was one of them was Sultai. One of them was straight Teamer, and the other three were four color Teamer or Teamer Black. And then the other decks were there's one Nardu vehicles, one green blue Pummeler. And one God Pharaoh's gift. So, so the energy decks, there isn't really an awful lot to say. Soul Tie is a little bit more aggressive, a bit lower to the ground, using Blossoming Defense to great effect. Uh, I don't know if you saw any of the Pro Tour coverage, Simon, but Blossoming Defense. No, I saw def- a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Blossoming Defense did some real work, and it can just do a number on you if you're, you know, not really expecting it. So, rather than playing some of the more expensive cards, you know, just being able to play something like long task club on turn three and leaving up blossoming defense can just be enough to wreck people yeah i always pick them up from bulk you can really kind of get a slight edge on people if, you, if you're building a deck and you've got like even just like a couple of copies in it you can make people play around it if you get someone with it in game one then they're just you just know for the rest of the game they're gonna it's gonna be in their mind oh blossoming defense has they got <laughs> blossoming defense so yeah great fun are you are you i'm getting a bit annoyed about i don't know about you but about decks being called energy decks. So uh, I was just being lazy. What what was it annoys you? Because energy is such a it's it's a brand new resource. Mm. Um, so we know even as soon as it was mm, not maybe not beforehand, but once it reached standard, that we knew it was going to be a big thing. It's basically a, a resource. Um, it can do extra stuff. Yeah. Basically, any deck in standard probably should be utilizing energy. 
wherever possible. Yeah. If it's just an Ether Hub, just to call decks. And I know, I know why, because they, they generate, they're, they're focused on generating energy to do extra things. But basically, every deck in standard should be utilizing energy because it's an extra resource to be abused. Well, uh, so just say, oh, this is a three color energy deck, this is a soul stage, this is a four color energy deck. It's a bit like, mm, I know what they're doing, they're just trying to summarize the deck in a certain category. But if you're playing standard, you should be abusing the energy resource. There are plenty of decks that don't know. For example, there are. Um, Approach of the Second Sun decks doesn't use energy, and the Tokens mm -hmm. deck don't use energy. Ramanat Red doesn't use energy. And do they do they not do they not have energy in them at all? Um, right. I know I know um, Godfairy's Gift has some energy. Godfairy's Gift has a small amount of energy for one card Minister of Inquiries, and they used a great effect that energy. Yes, to, to, to pull off its game plan. Yes, hundred um, percent. So that I think even Mardi Vehicles uses energy for Ethersphere Harvester. Yes, I know I'm going on a bit of a, a bit on a limb. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is just calling a deck an energy deck, I don't think is efficient. No. Well, probably, no, that's probably, probably the thing is it is efficient. It's not descriptive of that. I don't know. One. I, I totally efficient. get what you're saying because, like, you could say, well, that they're, yeah, they all use energy, therefore they could all be called energy decks. And just to call a deck an energy deck is really misleading because mm -hmm. it was funny. The other day, so I heard someone describe team as mid range, and I was sitting there thinking, actually don't hear people call mm -hmm. it the mid-range deck and it is it is like the perfect example of a mid-range deck which has got these awesome creatures the ability to kind of change direction and be be aggressive or be slow and controlling depending on the matchup really good cards dirtly cards like a tune with ether um so uh, you know it, it is definitely a mid-range deck but you really really hear it called that and it's funny so you, there goes, to mere energy get it right yeah well actually i, I think this is the reason why I think, first of all, the naming conventions it, it is just that. It's a naming convention. Because if you think about Affinity and Mullen, there are no cards in, in Affinity that actually work and have the Affinity mechanic except Thoughtcast. But why is it called Affinity? So it's it's a naming convention. So like it's just a hangover from when it was actually using the Affinity mechanic. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So not all deck names make sense. I mean, that's just the way that is. And also, I've noticed this as well with mid-range decks this is what got me thinking about it quite a bit was mid-range decks don't tend to be called x mid-range or xy yeah. mid-range you think okay you have mono red aggro or you have blue white control but very rarely do you hear jund mid-range mm -hmm. or team a mid-range like it's just very it's not a very exciting it doesn't roll off the the tongue i guess it doesn't sound as good so i think it's partly down to that so it's all those little things like, you know, it, it really abuses energy and mid-range doesn't tend to be used as a naming convention. So I think it's just kind of caught on. But I get what you're saying. I think I think one one GP, you're going to have a top eight and it's all energy. All totally different. Well, they're not going to be totally different. But, you know, mm. Salto energy, full colour energy, Teamer energy. It's just going to be energy at the end of everyone. Yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Because you could argue on it's your... Like, it's like calling... It's like before energy, calling decks uh, three-colour mana decks because they all they use land. <laughs> That's <laughs> a good point. A bit, yeah. But now if we follow your, lo your logic, this top eight had all energy decks in it because, you know, they all utilise it in some form or another. Yeah. We call them all energy de decks. Yeah. So energy everywhere in this top eight. The most interesting one for me is the blue green pummeler it's not a new deck but it's hilarious in as much that's what i want to start at yeah i mean i'm not going to talk about the team of decks the salt deck it's very much based around the top eight uh the the deck that won the pro tour Ixalum. and then god pharaoh's gift again very very modeled around uh, i think it was pascal maynard's um blue white god pharaoh's gift deck it has that I'm very. That's made a top eight because I was listening to one of our podcasts, a couple of weeks old, a couple of weeks old now, <laughs> where um, God's Rose Gift won. What did it win? It won a GP. Yeah. And you said, "Oh, it's just a flash in the pan." <laughs> prepared for it now. Won't be good again. I think it was. It was at the Pro Tour, top eight this GP. Yeah, it's so done it. I'll bring that up. 
just for bringing that up, Luke. Yeah, I was wrong. <laughs> it's 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 frustratingly strong, and I think it's got quite a re- it can have what quite a reasonable game against Mono Red, just with the life link and the stupid angel angel invention life linking stuff. So it can cause that deck fits, which is why rampaging for Ossidon is such an important part of of those decks now because it just needs a way to not be losing to a random life linkers. Mm. But yeah, no, yeah. absolutely, Godfarer's gift is very powerful. But yeah, this green blue pummel deck, <laughs> I played I against like it. it. I played against it online. Cartouche of knowledge or one with the wind on a bristling hydra is not fun. No, it doesn't look good. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is pummeler. I'm expecting, you know. Larger than life, blossoming defense, that sort of stuff. And then when he cast one with a wind on a hydra, I was like, right, okay, fine. That's how this game is. So I didn't realize I was playing Ixalan Unlimited. Surely that should be called Green Blue Pummeler Energy Decks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. It's funny. It's a funny deck. I like I like the one of one one with the wind. It is great. It looks awesome. It looks great fun. It is pretty sweet. I like. I appreciate dive down as well. Two or two dive downs. So hex proof, yeah. large than life seems. I guess it's just to give it the extra. Oh, good for for pummeler, obviously. Yeah. Have you ever been hit by a twenty twenty pummeler? I don't play enough standard to be hit by twenty twenty. Oh no, no, I have. When it first emerged, I was yes, I was hit by twenty twenty pummeler. Basically, you untap with pummeler and you cast larger than life and boom. You know, yeah. any amount of energy. I think I think the worst I've been hit with was a forty forty one. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Does it have flying with one with the wind as well? No. I like I like this deck. I'm just annoyed it's not called an energy deck. <laughs> Doesn't use enough energy. That's the problem. It's got loads of energy. <laughs> no, not enough. We're gonna have to call up what who who names these decks, what the rules are, and when you classify an energy deck or not. Apparently. Yeah. So I'll, I'll stop going on that now. <clears throat> So yeah, that was GP Warsaw. So there's some uh, some old and new in there. Well, actually, I don't even know if there was any new in there. But uh, Mardu great... Vehicles Energy Deck. No, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see Mardu Vehicles is back. I I got beat by it at a uh, standard showdown the other week quite efficiently. Hmm. Is that what you're building now? Mardu Vehicles? No, not quite. I'm going. I'm trying out Red Black Vehicles. Um, Red Black Vehicles. Yeah. So essentially, I was trying out Ramanat Red. Obviously, there's very it's very beatable. If you want to beat it, you can beat it. So <laughs> I've <laughs> I've tried black to essentially. So it's, essentially, it's around that red deck, but with artifact theme to kind of plug some of the little weaknesses in it. So having the vehicles. Way out of nice integration, isn't it? Yeah, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> You're a child. Every time. Yeah, but the cards, the cards gas, and also part, but, but genuinely part of the problem is so some of the some of the more difficult things you can go against against Teema is if someone goes turn one attune the ether, turn two long tusk cub, and they're able to get the long tusk cub out of shock range and then very quickly out of light, uh, lightning strike range. So playing black to then have access to use cut to ribbons at its most uh, to its full potential. And also to have access to unlicensed disintegration so that I can kill stuff with toughness more than four. That's the main reason, really. So it means I have less reliance on the burn because the burn's built into the removal, which is nice. Yeah, that's it, really. The rest of the deck more or less staying the same and just playing a couple of vehicles, which I'm hoping will um, be just as fine against control because they'll be wrath proof, the vehicles, which is nice. But it does make a braids better against me. So. It's just an idea. Um, it might not work, and I'm, I might just end up playing team, but we'll we'll see. I've had a bit of success with it at the moment. I'm halfway through a league, and I'm three and zero with it at the moment. So pretty good. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. Funnily enough, unlicensed disintegration has been particularly good, and has so has cut to ribbons. Actually, cut to ribbons basically got me through a board stall, sitting there like, well, I've got no way I can win this game, but I could just burn them out with cut to ribbons, which is great. I play cut to ribbons in my green red dinosaur deck. Yeah. It does have a way to use ribbons, but rarely. Cuts it's, good enough. Cuts, yeah, I think cuts fine. You know, Mizzy and Mortars is uh, is fine. So looking at the Warsaw top eight, and then look, you know, you could be thinking, actually, Ramanat Red's dead. You know, Ramanat Red is not not a thing you need to be worried about anymore. It's obviously not going to make top eight of a GP. But then if you look at GP Shanghai, you have 
not one, not two, not three, but four copies of Ramon Up Red in that top eight. Which their is... meta games are not different to. Um... Yeah, they like Mono Red. Mm. <laughs> um, and then you have one, two, three, three team of mid range decks, one of them being a four color mid range deck. The differences in cards between these lists across GPs, let alone the you know the different ones in 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 each individual top eight, is is not an awful lot. But we'll post the the links to the deck list below. There's a couple of different things in in some of them, like you might have a, a vizier of many faces in one, uh, an extra Chandra here. One guy's playing the gate main deck, which is interesting. Um, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, and um, one Supreme Will, which was in the Pro Tour. So that's that's being seen more. Again, similar line to the one of Blossoming Defense. You know, you slam down a Scarab God and then someone goes Supreme Will and you're like, oh, what? What just happened there? And then you're going to be constantly worried about that from the next game, which is funny. Yeah. But yeah, the core cool bit of spice, I guess, in this top eight was the Grixis Tokens from Akada Neuer. Grixis Foster Tokens, yeah, just looking at that. Yeah, now this is sweet. So, oh, no demon, though. I was hoping for a demon. They do have the Inventor's Goggles, which is the one one mana artifacts which you can equip to artificers for free when they come in. Gives them plus one, plus two. Aethersphere Harvester, Sky Sovereign. But then they're playing a one of Scarab God. And then they're playing Maverick Thopterist, which, if you're not familiar with that, is the five mana 2-2, two, two, which <laughs> makes <laughs> makes two one ones, but it's got Improvise. Um, two one one thopters though. Two one one yeah. thopters, so they fly about. And then Ether Sweeper, two mana one two. When it enters the battlefield, get two energy. When it attacks, spend two energy. You make thopters. PNLR, which makes thopters. World of Virtuoso, which makes thopters. So I'm seeing a little bit of a theme here, but it's a good theme because evasive tokens are pretty, pretty good. If you can gum up the board, use their harness lightnings, magma sprays, metallic rebukes to deal with the uh, tricky permanents, and then just get in over the top. With some tokens, this thing's pretty cool. Playing Reverse Engineer, which is a card I do like as well, so the five mana draw spell with Improvise. But um, the craziest thing here, which is what I think it's really trying to do, is abuse Decotion Module. De no, Decoction Model. Module. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny word to say. Um, it's a two mana artifact. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you get an energy. And then you can pay for to return target creature you control to its owner's hand. So. What this does, if you have World of Virtuoso out with this, then you can effectively make Thopters for cheap, which is good. And then whenever, so you make a Thopter for three, three energy, and then it enters, and then Decoction Module then gives you an energy. So then you can put that towards making more. Yeah. I played against the Magical Christmas Land deck, is the only one that describe it, which had Decoction Module, and then the other modules that they made out with Kaladesh, the ones that whenever you make energy you put plus one plus one counts on something or whatever you got multiples of these out on a world of virtuoso you basically then immediately was able to make something like six or seven different tokens they all got plus one plus one world of virtuoso was like an eight nine and he had like four 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 or five four four fopter tokens so like if you get multiples of those out or you know it can do some stupid things but this one seems a bit more sensible than that definitely interesting obviously scarab no, I, like, pretty good. I like the deck i think it's quite good yeah nice to think a bit different yeah, definitely. I do like uh, seeing the deck lists from these GPs because, or even um, nationals, because they do seem to be much more creative than what you see as the norm in like the American tournaments. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're quite seem to be quite orientated. Europe seems to be quite orientated the same as American tournaments, from what I've gathered. I mean, I'm not a big examiner of GP uh, Pro Tour top eights, really. I, I, I browse them, but from what I see, the ones from the East are a lot more unique, and we seem to follow the the American yeah. for, for meta game purposes. Definitely, definitely. It's a lot of the the tournament stuff I look at is is these big places in America. It's the easiest thing. To, I think it's the easiest thing to do. After a while, you kind of get used to it. But it's still, I think it's still good to look elsewhere. Though. You definitely see oh, some definitely. more interesting things. But I think that the one we just looked at, especially the the, the fault the deck is aiming to exploit their own meta game. So it's something totally different. It's something you'd never see in in the US top eight. Yeah. We just saw a blue green pummeler was to exploit the uh, the US meta or, or the the uh, EU meta more like the same with uh, with this deck here. Yeah. It's always very interesting. Absolutely. Okay, so the final GP that occurred over last weekend was in Atlanta. 
and mm, busy uh, weekend. Yeah, very busy weekend. So back to back to America for an interesting take. So, funnily enough, actually, there's a couple of lists here which are equally interesting. So, you had your normal mix. I think there was four team of energy. Sorry, team of mid range style decks. You have four, one of which playing Nico Bolas, which is nice. Oh. Nice to see Bolas back in a in a, a team of deck. So instead of playing two Vraskas, just put Nico Bolas in there. I mean, card's pretty strong. Um, but that's the most spice. That is the most spice I think from all the team of lists. And then we had one Mardu vehicles, two Raman Up Reds, and one Esper approach to the Second Sons. So Mardu vehicles is pretty. Pretty stock, uh, main deck Chandra's, only one Hazaret, which is interesting. And speaking of only one Hazaret, if you look at Ben Stark's red list, Desert Red they've called it. Um, oh, yeah, I saw that, yeah. This, this is odd to me. I, I do not understand this, but it's very, very strange numbers on this. So a lot of red decks will play three Carry Zev Skyships, so it's only playing two for a start. It's got three main deck Glory Bringers. Only one Hazaret and three Sand Strangler, which is the Flame Tongue Kavu like creature. So, four mana, three, three beast. When it enters the battlefield, if you've got a desert in the bin or you control a desert, it does three damage to target creature. It's an yeah. awesome card, really good card, but it just hasn't been seen in play. Uh, it's only really in the sideboard around the Pro Tour Hour of Devastation, largely only really used against red. So, it's interesting to see it here. In the main board as well. In the main board, yeah. And you'd think, do I want to play Hazaret? Do I want to play Sand Strangler at four? What am I? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's crazy. And 25 lands in the main as well. A lot of the time you see them sideboarding into the 25th land. But he's just going, nope, we're going to do this. Also, he's really throwing caution to the wind with the mana base. You see the four Ramanat ra- Ruins, Sun Scorched Desert, only three of. But that's because he's running two Scavenger Grounds main. And three Dunes of the Dead, which is the when it is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, create a two-two black zombie creature token. So like it. awesome with Ramanat Ruins, you go right. I'll sacrifice Dune of the Dead, ping you for two, and you get a zombie. Yeah. Which, as we said before, when we were going through the set review, comes in untapped, which is great. So that's really interesting. In the testing I've had, I, I found just running the extra copies of Scavenger Grounds. So running four Sun Scorched Deserts and you know one or two Scavenger Grounds, I was like, oh, sometimes. You know, between drawing too many Ramanat Ruins and Colourless Lands, you don't always get the red you need. So I find it interesting. He's just really going all out. He's got effectively eight Colourless Lands that he could he could just draw all of those and not actually cast any red spells. So it's really brave mana base there. Um, What's the treasure maps for? <laughs> I was just about to get to that. I I do not know. I mean, I'm not going to question Ben Stark. You know, he's yeah, obviously, he's obviously going to have. <laughs> oh, space, so like, Oi, what is this? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I do not know. I mean, one of the problems with the red deck is a complete lack of library manipulation. But one of the other problems with red decks is they tend to be very mana hungry and you want to be using your mana as much as possible. So are you you know having to, to leave one mana up to activate this could be a problem. But then also maybe it's a good thing because you're able to use the mana. It's a mana sink in a sense because you're tapping it. Tapping your mana and you you haven't and, and scrying if you haven't got a play or you you know you've got a you've got a three drop on turn four so you can then use your map. I don't know. It seems like an odd addition. I've seen it in the sideboard versus control is a great way to kind of get value. But I can't understand that. But in the two in the main, hmm, you'd think you'd want some sort of burn spell. I guess he's running most of the burn spells. But... Four lightning strike, three a braid, two shock, two spray. I mean. That's you fairly can't stock. Two more spray, really. No, not two more spray. Two more, two more shocks. Really. That number of burn spells tends to be around about the number that people run with. Uh, yeah. Whereas the, the only difference being, instead of two magma spray, it's two, it's four shock, and then maybe sprays in the board. I, I guess it helps you ramp into enough mana because it creates the three treasure tokens, ramps up to enough mana to activate your ramming that ruins mm. more often and still play threats. Maybe. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Yeah. But this deck seems like it's tuned to go a bit bigger than the traditional Ramana Red decks with the 25 lands, three main deck Chandras, three main deck Roybringers. And a lot of the times, excuse me, a lot of the times Red will board into Chandra and Roybringer to beat Teema. So my, my assumption is this could be a, 
an extra little bit of tech to gain advantage over Teema, perhaps. The mag instead, yeah. We can gain one more often, yeah. Yeah, and and maybe the treasure maps that as well to to try and just kind of grind a little bit of a card advantage, not necessarily card advantage, but card selection in a in a very tight matchup because often it's quite anecdotal. The Teema versus Red matchup is, is whoever wins the dice roll. So you need to be playing relevant cards. So this helps you to draw relevant threats. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's just a late term play. Okay. That's, that's my guess. Three round paging for Osadon helps as well against the Word of Virtuoso, which is a massive problem normally if you've got lot of, lots of one drops. But definitely, mm-hmm. definitely an interesting take on it. And maybe maybe this is the way to beat Teema. And may, maybe this is that's, that was the aim of the game. And, you know, he made the top eight. So clearly he would have had to play Teema at some point. You, know. you would have thought so, yeah. Yeah, he's not going to dodge it all 15 rounds. Uh, and then lastly, very quickly, we have an approach to the second sun deck. And I've been wanting to try an Esper list for a long time. So I'm really pleased to see it actually worked. Because one thing I felt is just straight up blue-white. The removal is f- beyond fumigate and settle the wreckage and cast out. The removal is not that great, especially at the lower end of the curve. So this guy has done exactly exactly the right thing, I think. And just effectively gone for a splashing black to give him fatal push. Just for fatal push. Which is totally worth it. And Vraska's yeah, contempt. Yeah, Vraska's contempt in this in the sideboard. Because the problem is someone plays a Beaumont Courier uh, against Blue White Approach and then you lose. <laughs> <laughs> Which it, it, it and honestly it is really sad because you what you then do is your options are Slash of Talons, which is terrible and only really needed in the sideboard, or Aether Meltdown. And they're still hitting you with that Beaumont Courier. They're still getting the cars under it. All of a sudden, they then sacrifice it at some random point in the game. Yeah. And they've drawn eight cards. And you're like, oh, okay. I love Beaumont Courier. Someone let me discuss someone let me run that red for a couple of weeks for some standard showdowns, like last season. Uh, yeah, we love, fell in love with Beaumont Courier. He's great, isn't he? He's great. Yeah. It's so funny as well, because it's easy to see the people that have been wrecked by it. Because it's just so funny when someone like harness lightnings it like almost immediately, or just like yeah. wastes a decent removal spell on it, and you're like, that was just a one-one. That's great. <laughs> and then you untap and play Hazaret, and they can't Braskers. They can't Braskers because <laughs> they've already used it on a Bowman Courier. But no, this this deck's really good. I'm loving the four Regal Caracal in the sideboard, just to really hate on red. A Scarab or Gods in the sideboard as well. It's always nice to board into that and torrential gear hulks to like have more creatures when people tend to board out their removal. But yeah, it's a, a really solid deck. I think it won actually this one. I think I believe it won that one. Really good. And okay. search for us counter, proving to be a good card. So that's one. That's one I one I did get right, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So that is all for now from us. If you like what you hear, then check us out at glimmerofgenius.podbean.com, where you can find all of our episodes to download. Or find us on Facebook at Glimmer of Genius. Also, if you're interested in even more Magic the Gathering content, then you can check out my YouTube channel, Vincent Games, where I post weekly updates from my vlog to MTG Gameplay, so do check that out if you're interested in even more content. But in the meantime, thanks very much for listening, and stay tuned for more. I'll see you tomorrow. That's all right, buddy. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.
It's a two mana artifact. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you get an energy. And then you can pay four to return target creature you control to its owner's hand. So the we more. We should be calling it Grixis Fox's Energy Deck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just jump on it. <laughs> you can edit that bit out. 